and thank you for joining us, not from very far away as well, being born half a mile away and sort of... Yes, I, I am a local resident, I'm actually a member here of the Union Club, so um, yeah, and I did do this a, few, a number of years ago, so thank you for giving up time. I know you've all got lectures and it's quite early in the evening, so um, it's not a bad turnout. Thank you for... Let's hope you're not going to be disappointed. Awesome. I'm sure we won't. Adam's um, doing this for the first time, by the way, so he's <laughs> brand new. Yeah, I have. I have. Uh, so, first question, Martin, can you tell us a bit about your initial journey into professional football and your journey into it? Well, I, um, from, as, from the age of, say, seven or eight, I was telling everybody that I was going to be a professional footballer. I watched the FA Cup final back in 1974, which was Liverpool versus Newcastle. And uh, I thought, OK, I've really was caught by the atmosphere, captured by the, the desire of the fans to be there, get into the stadium. Um, I just thought, that's me, I've got to do that. So my mum, I drove her mad actually trying to play football. So she took me to, for my, my eighth birthday, to a football club in Garsington, which is local to here. And I was, started training there and was a little bit too young but I managed to play for the year above and started scoring goals for fun as a young kid, it, remarkably, because I played as a defender pre predominantly. So all these goals, I think my father always felt, God rest his soul, that I didn't quite make it to the level, because he wanted me to be a goal scorer, because that's the position, isn't it? I think every kid starts out wanting to be a centre forward, not a, a left back or a right back. And so eventually I went to play further back through the team uh, was playing local football for the county and was scouted by Arsenal, um, which was almost a dream come true at that point because lots of other players uh, in my, my local teams were going to Queen's Park Rangers, going to Aston Villa with Oxford United. So it was a, a relief in the end to get a chance to go on trial to Arsenal. Yeah. Awesome. Um, just to touch on that a bit more, can you tell us a bit about the values and principles that you had when you were growing up. You mentioned single-mindedness. Could you explain a bit more about that? Well, I was very, very determined. Uh, when I talk now to uh, look back, I wasn't running a videotape of myself, but I've subsequently spoken to school teachers who said that I had this incredible determination, this desire to want to win, uh, would take over the team talks, even from a, a young age, to uh, boss people around and try and get the best from people. So I suppose they could see it, but I couldn't see that in myself. I just wanted to win. Uh, and then the, the goal then become about trying to, uh, to make it into the game. And then when I went to Arsenal to do my apprenticeship, uh, the best players basically were playing in London. You know, I don't know, I'm trying to relate it here to, you know, got, you know, the best musicians, the best mathematicians that, you know, in footballing terms, Arsenal then had some incredible players. So I went to do my apprenticeship there and um, I needed every ounce of that determination and every ounce of the ability and desire because in those first few years, you're really tested. And I was an with an incredible group of young players who six or seven of them went on to play in the first team uh, and play international football. So it was um, a very much dog eat dog situation every day. But I managed to, to get to where I wanted to, which was into the Arsenal first team. Mm -hmm. So, going on from that, can you tell us what are some of the most proud moments of your, of your career? Some of, not, proud, not proud. singular. Having children, um, you know, uh, introducing my oldest son to his new brother was probably the proudest day of my life. Um, football means a great deal to me, but family is obviously just ahead of it. Um, and then when we were having children, playing, you know, in that period of winning trophies, winning doubles, that's when I had my first uh, two children. Um, I met my wife, uh, Nicola, at school. Um, we're still together now, 32 years later. So that's um, an achievement. She's done well to, to, <laughs> to put up with me all that time. She's more determined than I am. So um, no, that, the proud moments uh, was playing in the Arsenal first team from a footballing sense. It was just like trying to climb, climb Mount Everest because they kept on saying, you can't do this and you can't do that. They don't look at what you can do. You have to have that inner belief that you're good enough, that resolve to get there. And it was a shopping list of things that I wasn't good enough at. And then suddenly I got in the team and we kept winning. And I realized that if I stay, uh, if I keep winning, I stay in the team. And it kept growing. I think it was nine games before we lost. 
Uh, and by that time, you, you, the rep your reputation's growing uh, and people are comfortable with you. They think you belong at that level. But uh, it's that first game where you break that door down. Um, you're on your own, really. So that was a, a big moment. At the beginning of your career, you left Aston Villa and then moved to Everton before returning to I Arsenal. left Arsenal first. Left Arsenal before returning to Arsenal was the next part of the question. Yes. Uh, what was it like as a young player to leave the club you'd grown up at and did you ever expect to return? Well, I, I, it was on a point of principle that I left Arsenal Football Club because I'd made it into the first team, uh, maybe unexpectedly, because there was a, such a, there was a really good group. And of course, Tony Adams was in my, there was three months between us and we were both to go on and play for England. So they had, along with Roe Castle and Mickey Thomas and Paul Merson and Niall Quinn, I don't know if you know these guys, they're fairly big names in the game or were became big names. Um, and my contract was, wasn't particularly good and I gambled on getting into the first team and was promised that once I get in the first team, things would change. And it was over 50 pounds. And you think about the millions of pounds involved today. Um, and I s wouldn't budge. I said, no, I want 50 pounds more. You're only offering me 50 pounds rise, but I've gone from a youth team player to the first team. So I, um, I said, well, I'm, if you don't improve that, I'm gonna leave. And they just said, no way, you're not, that's ridiculous. You need to negotiate. And I said, no, it's too late, which was stupid. I got emotional and I left. Uh, and the minute I did it, I realized I made a mistake. Um, but I had to pick up the pieces at Aston Villa. We were relegated, that was tough. We got promoted, which was magnificent. The greatest feeling ever, never mind winning Premier Leagues and doubles and European trophies. Getting back my Premier League status or Division One as it was then was bigger. And I kind of felt once I got that back, Villa back to where they were, because a lot of people left and I could have done, then I, I kind of moved away out the back door to a different situation and that was Everton. And uh, that, that worked out well because I managed to get into the England team and my career was, was, was moving upwards. Uh, but it was a difficult time for Everton. Everton had been a really successful team in the 80s and they were in a little bit of a plateau. So I went back to Arsenal uh, and that was almost like a, a miracle phone call. And I realised um, I'm going to get a second chance. Uh, it was almost like a dream that I'd woken up and the ground was the same. Many of my colleagues were still there, some had left. I'd missed out on uh, a lot of good moments with those colleagues. And here I was arriving back. But I never thought it was gonna be as difficult to come back as it, as it transpired, because those opening years were, were quite tough. Yeah. Moving on from that, who would you say was, were the hardest players, plural, to defend against? Well, when I played, I never really admitted anyone was any better than myself because it's like a boxer, isn't it? Going into a world title fight, uh, expecting to get knocked out. And I never did. Um, but when you look back on the, your career, the, you know, some of, I played against Ronaldo and Romario for England and they were like spinning tops. They, they had ABS breaks. They ran like the wind. They were top players. And it was one of those, oh, here we go. This is, this is another level. Um, I was lucky then to, to work with Burkamp and Henri, two of probably the finest players we've seen in the Premier League, training with them every day. Uh, there was a, that was a battle in itself, you know, because they would love to embarrass you if they could. So those were, those were some of the best players that have ever played the game. What would you say are some of those moments where they, they love to embarrass you? Well, because I was kicking them all around the park at a young age and they were young men and suddenly I was 38 when we went unbeaten for the whole season. So, you know, it was turning full circle, wasn't it? And I was then struggling to hang on to them, whereas at the start I was setting the tone or trying to in training. But I always saw that they were great individuals, they're great men. The likes of Patrick Vieira, another great footballer. Um, the Shearers, uh, Linekers, of course, they were difficult opponents. Um, the Van Nishiroy, which I'm surprised you haven't asked me a question about that yet. This is the longest interview I've ever done without being asked about <laughs> Van Nishiroy. They were all good players as well. Um, the, the Manchester United teams that we played against, um, Solskjaer, York, you know, Sheringham was a player who never really gets uh, enough credit. So there were lots of individuals. The, the Premier League's always been bursting with good centre forwards. Every club has got, a, and that was us up against them. So it was always very tough. Um, you know, that Ferdinand was another player that was uh, 
great forward. So there was always someone every week. Yeah. You mentioned the centre forwards. Let's talk about the centre backs. Um, who were your favourite centre backs to play to play alongside? Well, I was lucky because I, I played with Tony Adams from, and I was a I was a makeshift central defender, as we've already talked about. Played up front, played went to right back, and suddenly grew about a foot in in one summer and was shifted into central defence. So I kind of like came into that position, played with Tony in the youth team, the reserves. Uh, we actually won the uh, combination league. We didn't win the FA Youth Cup, and we were we were in real trouble for that. We got a massive rollicking from the from the club. So Sol Campbell was another uh, outstanding central defender. These guys have got that little bit of extra class, quality. They read the game really well. Uh, Ferdinand, of course, for, for England. I played with him in his opening international game, so I could see that Rio was going to be a top player. Um, yeah, so th those guys, I mean, in my club situation, to have the choice of Sol Campbell and Tony Adams is just the stuff of dreams. I, I also played with Steve Bold, who knew his, his role inside out, wasn't as mobile, only played for him once. Uh, but nonetheless, they were all of a, an outstanding quality. And then the next generation coming through, Matthew Upson, um, these types of players were, were coming through. Colo, Torre, great lad, great individual, who I also really enjoyed playing with. You've got to love playing with your partner. You're racing through these questions, Adam. You need to slow down a little bit. <laughs> I'll, face, I'll, 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 I'll try and pace myself. Um, as a sort of different topic of conversation, what are your thoughts on VAR? Are you pro, anti? Well, was there anybody at the weekend who didn't want that decision to go Leicester's way? Is there anybody? No. So it's kind of like we're shaping VAR to suit how we feel, aren't we, on the day? There was an opportunity for, it looked like it was going to go to extra time. The whole world and his man wanted Leicester to win the game. So VAR came to the rescue. So I think it's a good thing, but it's just the way that they're managing it at the moment. There are too many gray areas. Yeah. How would uh, you better manage it though? Well, first of all, I'd put more people into the VAR unit. I don't think they're, and I've spoken to people in there. There's, there's a time pressure and they often, you need another pair of eyes. I think the American system, I'm told, they have more people in that booth and it's like we're seeing situations where we're looking at um, you know we're, we're looking at a foul when actually the player's offside we're looking at the wrong instant if there's two people there or three they have two one overlooks it and one looks at the actual incident mm -hmm. I think we just need to make sure we've got the right people in there and take their time to find the right the right answer mm -hmm. um, I've been surprised that there's been situations where um, if you look back at last season and we've forgotten it now but Aston Villa it was against Sheffield United, the ball went over the line and goal line technology failed and VAR could have just come to the rescue and tell us that it was over the line but didn't. So, you know, I wonder whether the principle is wrong there, some of the sort of the blueprint of there has to be a situation where VAR rescues if there's been a real howler of a mistake made by the, the, the necessary equipment and the officials on the day. How likely do you think those changes are to actually be implemented though? Do you, do you think that there's something that's... Well, there's talk of technology that's coming in now where, because this is the shutter speed, I'm looking at that camera over there, and it's like the, the camera's not quick enough to pick up um, the movement of each player, the sort of shutter speed's not quick enough. Um, it's not like um, the cameras they have in horse racing for the photo, the photo finish, they're not as quick as that. So quite often, it's going to be interesting, maybe in the future, we're going to apply new science to some of the old pictures and realise that some of these offsides weren't offside. Um, so there's new technology coming, uh, we're told. Arsene Wenger now is working on that, isn't he, for FIFA. So we're, we're waiting, interestingly, to see how that will pan out. But when it came in for the World Cup in 2018, I thought it was a real success. And I thought that they got the balance right. But we haven't in the Premier League because we've insisted on certain little nuances, little changes. Um, for instance, the offside that, that we were told that um, the, the flag wasn't going to go up straight away and now it, you know now it, sorry it was going to go straight up and the player would would accept that and even if they ran through and scored and they saw a flag up no one was going to argue well that was wrong wasn't it so now they'd keep the flags down they followed the protocol for the rest of Europe I'm not sure why we wanted to be different but we got there in the end yeah um, what is your opinion on the current Arsenal ownership and David E.K.'s purported bid um, to purchase the debt well, I mean, there's a situation where we're, we're not having any money really 
yeah, let's have a drink, Adam. Let's just let's do it. We're, we're, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. You shouldn't be touching my glass. <laughs> um, ownership. Well, it's the type of ownership, isn't it, that we have? And it's, um, if you saw at the weekend Leicester, and you can pronounce the name of the Leicester owner for me, but there's a special relationship, isn't there? A special bond. And there was an emotional link between him, the owner. Obviously, there's been a massive history there. Really, very sadly, lost his father in that horrific incident, and the, they're bonded together. So that, but you can tell before that there was a special relationship. Um, they're there because they want to do well to help the community, and and main part some of their money. Whereas other owners are not doing that. It's very much a business plan, and there's always got to be some level of emotion with football clubs. And I think the ownership of the clubs in Germany is we should be taking a leaf out of their book where there's a 50% ownership by the fans. A match day is a celebration for, for the fans. So they, they're, they're actually, their ticketing prices, if, I don't want to bore people, but you can go, they pay for your travel in Germany. So you deserve a day out to a game. So we're going to pay your travel. That's a fantastic idea, isn't it? Not, oh, we're going to make it as difficult as possible for you to travel, and we're not going to have any tra trains available when you want to travel. You know, it's the reverse, actually. It's a celebration. Everyone's worked hard. Go to the games. We're going to cover the cost. And that's brilliant. That's what we should be doing here. That's what we should be doing. I don't understand the, why it's so expensive to go to the games when the TV revenue is so vast. We are surviving without, at the moment, any revenue from the gate receipts. So we need to look at that going forward as to how much money and where then it's distributed throughout the game. That's the, the next challenge. Yeah. Do you think that's likely to be a, a tenure thing in our lifetimes or much, much further down the line, that change? No, I think, I think what we've seen recently where the greed has come in, I think that's sort of a catalyst for change. We just need, we need government um, positioning. We need help. People are canvassing that. There's a group of players now that have written to the government trying to lobby some sort of um, ombudsman, or speak of us, I suppose, to sort of control. I don't, I'm not happy with the amounts of money that don't filter their way through the, the lower leagues. They're very much on their own. The Premier League, I mean, when it was formulated in 92, we didn't see a huge clamour like we're seeing now, but really, that they were, that's when the wealth was being distributed to the, to the, the, the elite clubs. Um, I don't know why, but the FA weren't able to sort of act with any governance there to sort of make sure that monies were distributed. I don't think they had the control. It's about the government now cre creating that control. And maybe the, the, the wealthy, uh, I think there's still enough money for them to make these wealthy owners. Um, but then we want to see, we're not comfortable with all these millions of pounds just staying with the top clubs and not being filtered lower down. We've got a local team here, Oxford United, by the way, playing in a playoff. Uh, is that tonight or when is it? Is there any football fans here? <laughs> when is it? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. There you go. So we've got a local team here which has suffered, isn't it, big time financially and was in the top division um, in my lifetime, long before your lifetime. I actually played for Arsenal against Oxford, which was a, a proud day for me actually because um, Oxford has only spent just a few years in the top division, it's predominantly been lower league. Division two for many years, but I would like to see them come up. And I think if, they were, if the money was distributed better, then we'd have a better chance to see people, other new teams, making it into the big time. Do you think that fans should have a say on the ownership of a football club? And if so, how should they be involved in that in particular? Very much so. The fans, you know, they're making their, themselves heard now. You're seeing that at Manchester United, you're seeing it at Arsenal, you saw it at Chelsea. Uh, and in fairness, Abramovich has done very well for them. He's put an awful lot of money in himself. Um, whether or not you can, you know, this is what they're looking for, isn't it, to legislation for the government, to whether or not they can create ownership. Is it too late now that they own, I think they spent nearly a billion pounds on buying the shares at, at Arsenal, at my football club. Um, how do they dilute those shares now if they're going to give them to the fans? You know, we'll have to wait and see whether it's, it's almost too late from that point of view. Um, but if there's any changes we can make, um, then I'd be happy to see them. Would any of the current Arsenal team fit into any of your titles? We're going running? back to Arsenal now, Adam. We're yeah, flying back, around the place. Back, back to <laughs> Arsenal, yeah. This is how we do it here. I'm going to talk to everybody here as if they don't know anything about the Arsenal team that I played in. So we went unbeaten for a whole season. It was almost, well, it is unique, okay? 
I think it'll be done again, but it, we got close a few times, by the way, haven't we? we? We saw Liverpool in the last few seasons. Will this Man City team do it? I don't know. Um, but what well, I can't remember the question now. <laughs> Would any of the current Arsenal team fit into your title? Well, team? it's such a ridiculous question. That's why I've forgotten it. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you look at the history of Arsenal Football Club, where there are many players throughout history would have got into that, into that group. Such was the quality. Maybe you're looking at the likes of Liam Brady, um, back in the day would, would probably have got into, the, into that group. I don't want to be disrespectful to the 71 team, the, you know, Frank McClintock's and the, uh, Jerry Armstrong, great players. But each time I'm thinking there's a Perez or there's a Burkamp or there's a Henri, you know, slightly in front um, or a Tony Adams. So, for any era, that would have been difficult to get into it. And the, the current team is struggling. It, it's struggling. It's got a young manager. It's looking like it's not going to make Europe for the first time in a number of years. And it needs heavy investment. Um, and 1 to 11, uh, the team is now needs to be changed. I think that's quite clear. I mean, there's, there's maybe three or four. I think Aubameyang is a, an outstanding talent. Uh, Tierney. We've seen Saka, Smith Rowe. So there's really good young players. but. Um, the core of a team when it wins anything is usually between the age of 23 and 30 and we've got we're at the wrong side of those scales you know just from the numbers game um, and I'd like to see that change um, so we should see some really good solid players coming in there I think the manager's a great coach I'm not sure of his managerial credentials his decision making at times frustrates me um, you know, the, there seems to be obvious decisions when Saka wants to play left back. You know, let, we're, we're not playing, we're playing Xhaka there, not Saka. And we're playing in a top European game. And then three days after Lord Mayor show against West Brom, he goes there. And then he's outstanding when it seemed obvious to put him there four games before. So I think his decision making has to sharpen up. But um, nonetheless, he's a very young man with huge uh, responsibilities on his shoulders. So, and he's won an FA Cup and a Community Shield. So there's good and bad. Uh, but I think they need to support him and, uh, and um, give him money to buy players. Of course. To then not keep jumping around, let's stay on Arsenal for a bit. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> big surprise. Um, what were your thoughts on Arsene Wenger when he first started as manager? Did you think that he'd be as big a success as he was, if he was? Well, when Arsene Wenger first walked into the room, it was a, it, it, he wouldn't have been out of place here, actually. He looked more like a geography teacher than, <laughs> than, than a, a football manager. It's, there's no doubt about that. Lee Dixon, I think, has been quoted as saying that many, many times, and it was very true. Um, we just thought he was just a, a great man, very calm, um, and he kept because of the recognition. And the boss was never his vision was never great. Anyway, whenever we we had a misdemeanour, he never saw it, did he? Famously, I did not see it. You know, uh, don't ask me. I did not see it, and it was always right in front of the dugout. And he would say hello to you, maybe three or four times and I'd say, boss, you've already said hello to me. And he just had this big smile on his face. And, and it was this, I thought this guy's so nice. Can we, can we win things with nice people? And he demonstrated to me that you can. If you trust them, uh, you believe in them and you love them. I think there was a love from the manager. His style of management was, was outstanding. That he made you feel that without you in the team, you weren't gonna be successful and he had a quiet word with everybody. And everybody's looking to see, you know, in any workplace, people know when the manager's talking to the workers. Uh, not with him, you didn't really know when it happened. He was so casual with the players. Um, and really for me, he kind of unraveled the coil. That was, there was a talent there, but I couldn't quite you know, develop into somebody that could win things and go into the top level, and that all changed. So I have to... Um, I had to thank Carson Wenger for that. Um, of course, I felt I had other qualities as well. So I was, I was always, I never shut up in the dressing room at that stage. I wasn't always like that, but I was being allowed to have my voice. Um, and that really came from, from the manager. Because in that season where we went unbeaten, I changed, my role had to change. I was one of, um, I, was, I helped Colo Torre to take my place. Um, which doesn't happen because we talked about how it's a dog eat dog industry, uh, cutthroat. It's like a jungle. It really is. You know, it looks great on the outside, doesn't it? You know, these footballers are all earn this incredible amount of money, but they've all had to work 
incredibly hard to get there and step on people to get to the top. But then when you get to the top, you have suddenly become a team player because you realize without the strength of your colleagues, you can't be successful. Um, but I accepted the change that was coming because of the manager, the environment he created. I helped Colo Torre to, to take my place and with every one of his opponents. Um, and I got a pleasure out of doing that uh, because he was a wonderful guy, great player, um, and he needed to understand what was ahead of him. And I, I used to look in around the dressing room and say to the players, um, this is special, take a good look around this room. You're doing that now. And because guys, I've waited a whole career to get, and I've had some good teams tell me, but to get to this level with you, this is amazing. And I've spoke to people since who said, oh, I remember you saying that, because after that we did, it went down a little bit, we didn't win games, we lost games, but I, you know, as a senior player, you know, don't you? You're coming to the end and you can see it. So I could tell people what was, what, what was happening, whereas we don't often embrace in the moment what's happening. But I can look back uh, what I can still remember uh, vividly, that feeling of being with winners every day of my life. It was a tremendous group of, of, of men with great aura. When they came into the room, every one of them had a stature. Uh, they, were, they were true winners, but they were great individuals firstly, great people to be with, great human beings. And I think that was um, really important to me. Yeah. So to go back to Wenger, would you say that after, after him, that Arsenal regressed in some ways and was sacking him the sort of right idea? I think Arsene Wenger stayed too long. Um, I think that they needed to create a career path for, for Arsene Wenger to go upstairs. I think it's a great waste. He could be equally as adapt in the boardroom as he was in the dugout. Uh, I don't know why um, that, wasn't, that journey wasn't created, whether or not he wanted to even be a part of that. But I do feel there should have been a succession plan of management, of identifying key individuals that could have followed on. We're now hearing about a takeover and we're hearing about Henri and Vieira and Burkamp. I don't really understand why those three are not at the club now. And, and, but Arsene Wenger could have seen that. So Wenger had great vision, but that's, that was a mistake. Uh, maybe he wasn't privy to that. But we can forgive him that because of what he did, he did to the football club and what he changed, the, the stadium, the titles. Um, I'm still eating now in the way that Arsene Wenger trained me to eat. This, you know, this, I don't eat meat. I don't eat meat. Wenger was telling me not to eat meat. Well, it's new now, but it, was, it wasn't, you know, 30 years ago. Let me tell you, no one was doing that. So um, it was always a, a, an education. It was just for me, I just felt the really, the great leaders find uh, an exit strategy and we didn't find that for Arsene Wenger and for me he should still be at the club he should still be at the boardroom level uh, and passing on his knowledge because we're making mistakes with a, a new young manager when I think with Wenger overseeing that we wouldn't be making as many as we are we could get back to where we once were much quicker. Mm -hmm. Let's zoom out a bit then would you say that England is heading for another golden generation of international football? Well, it's not heading it. We are, we look at the quality we have. If you, know, if you look at Foden, Mason Mount, um, Grealish, will he make the squad? He's coming back from a shin injury. Um, you know, Stones, I'm really pleased for him now, back, back in the team. So Declan Rice developing, growing. There's so, much, so many right backs, we don't know where to start. Have we got a team of right backs? Walker probably is in front at the moment, isn't he? The way he's playing for Man City. So it's, I wonder if the template of Man City will just will sort of be in superimposed into, into the England team and where we can get Foden, Sterling into the front line, we can get Mount uh, into that midfield um, and do we play with a three, do we play with a four? I'm pretty certain that Gareth Southgate's agonising at the moment over what formations, what players. He, for some reason, didn't want 26 players. I'm delighted he's 26 players. Because I think then if there's any injuries, we've got three more bodies that we can bring in. It might be tricky in terms of the bench and training sessions. But nonetheless, I think there's, there's nothing like going to a tournament to, to gather experience and see how people react. So the more players that can go, the better. Of course, the 1 to 11 is the key thing. And, and Gareth now will be working out uh, where this group is right now. 
Is it still development space for, for a back three? Or are we ready to commit to a back four? Which I thought we were after the last World Cup and go from there. But there's been one or two changes since then. So let's wait and see. We spoke a bit about the type of manager earlier on, um, including the Leicester, um, Leicester manager. Um, my question there is, in the context of something like the Super League and the inevitability of that, what is your view on the future progression of that and how it's going to unfold? Well, the Super League, we hope we never see it. We, it, it. For me, I was never really concerned with it. I, didn't, I thought it would disappear quickly because the fans were, people weren't going to accept this and you've got to have jeopardy in sport. You can't have sort of the American model where there's no relegation. And I, that's really what it was about. I thought at the beginning that they were just jostling for more, for more power within the Champions League. And uh, the, the one thing that does worry me is the, is the voice of the player. Um, in all of this, we need a stronger union because I think it's very e easy to look at it and say, OK, the players get paid a fortune, but they're paying too many games now and the Champions League have just bolted on another two or four games for next season, uh, quietly. You know, in any one season now, you could be playing close to 60 matches. That's quite a lot of games, and especially if you want to be there, you're desperate to play in every one. There's no real protection for the players, so that worries and concerns me. And the, you know, whoever takes over at the PFA, and I'm not sure why that hasn't happened yet, they've got to be stronger, and they've got to protect the players, and they've got to look after uh, the welfare of their football players you know, we've had a lot about dementia and heading the ball and, and stuff, and you, as a former player, you're worried, you're concerned for that. So we're going to introduce more games. You know, that, that's another 50 headers a season, isn't it? Let, let's just break it down and just try and protect the players occasionally. Gundogan came out recently and said, you know, through the back door, the Champions League have suddenly just created more matches for us because we've knocked super, the Super League on the head. But the, you know, the Champions League needs to look at that as well. So. Bigger squads, I suppose. Um, they, if, you, if you look at um, the Man City team now, I mean, he's making eight, nine changes at a time, isn't he? He's really protecting his players, and somehow they're still being successful. Won the, they've won the League Cup now, they've won the Premier League, and um, they go head to head with Chelsea in the Champions League final. So the Premier League uh, quality of the teams is in really good health, and that is linked to the money, that is linked to the wealth. And the club's now uh, are signing a new contract with the broadcasters again, so for another four years to secure that wealth coming in. But Adam, it needs to be distributed. We might be able to get you a new pair of socks. I'm quite happy with those <laughs> pink Thank socks. You. Yeah, no, <laughs> funky. Um, are there any questions for the audience, by the way? Are we yeah, we're about, to, we're about to move on. Uh, the last 15 minutes are uh, audience questions. So, um, yeah, I'm mean, going to ask about two more questions. Then the audience that have been very carefully thinking about their questions We'll have a chance. It'll just be a hands up thing and then I'll just call upon, call upon you guys. So to move on briefly as my like, last two questions. First one is a bit about your life as a pundit. Um, oh. Could you tell us, is there a funniest moment in a match that you've, you've covered? Funniest moment? Not, uh, oof, not really, no. I, you know, you, I thought you were going to brief me on some of these questions. You haven't briefed me on any of them yet. Um, no, it, I, I haven't. And I, I do like to bring, I like humour in my life. People don't hear it enough in my commentaries because the people, you, we have fussy listeners at the moment. So we, in a way, the broadcasters have saved football, haven't they, in this period? They all thought that the armchair fan was going to kill football, OK? But it saved it through this period, that's for sure. But I do feel that where the fans at the moment can't go and criticise their, and let's be fair, a lot of the fans go and have a good shout at, the, at their team, don't they? Come on, you're rubbish, you know. Awesome that all comes, that comes the way now of, of the, the broadcasters. So if you're a commentator, a co-commentator or a pundit, we get fed up listening. I mean, I do. I put the television on and there's certain people that I just, they I get on my nerves because they feel like they know everything. But we're only trying to do our jobs. So I think people need to cut a bit of slack. And that's been, there's been a lot of stick on Twitter. A lot of people now that they're, they're just a few weeks ago, they, everybody boycotted Twitter just for a little while, just to say, come on, let's cut this abuse. So um, I just try and, uh, I'm not really um, trying to prove anything to anybody. I'm a natural commentator, so I want to comment on your, your socks, you know. And Which you I have. thought you're looking very yeah. smart, by the way, and Thank I you. think you're doing the job very well. <laughs> and, you know, I'd like to hear more from the audience, but yeah. it's, 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 I'm a natural, <laughs> well, they're, they're still out there. All right, but I'm a, so I'm a natural commentator, naturally. Um, and it, people want to criticise, very easy to criticise. 
But I know how they feel because I, I think a game should be able to breathe. I think there are certain moments. I don't like it if a commentator says, um, don't get me wrong, because I'm like, well, we can't get you wrong. You either tell us what it is or what it isn't. So stop saying that. So it, it, certain things infuriate me, and I find it hard to watch a game of football now without critiquing the commentator or the, or the people doing the show. You know, why is Ashley Cole not between Ian Wright and, and Alan Shearer? He's out on, we should be in the middle. Why are we put him there? So I'm all the time trying to be creative, uh, but I know how the job should be done. And I think the, uh, the broadcasters, Sky, BT, BBC, I think they do uh, a fantastic job um, in bringing to the nation, to the, to the, we have an incre incredible desire for football here. And I think through this period, we've seen how much people really love football. And I think the broadcasters have done a really good job without any real credit for that, because it's now time for us to get back into our stadiums again and to enjoy it for real in a, in a different way. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, I think it'd be easier as well to commentate when there's people in the crowd. I thought at the weekend, it, you could see it was more spontaneous, wasn't it? When the goals go in, I think it's easier to give that drama, the, the adrenaline's flow, flowing. Uh, without um, the crowds in, in, in the stadium, I think it's been quite tricky. Yeah. Exactly. To then move on to the last question, and then I'll stop talking. Um, <laughs> maybe. You haven't um, said anything yet. Maybe. So <laughs> Um, as a last question, you've already given me a lot of advice on my socks and lots of other things. Um, so as a result of that, I want to ask, is there any career-defining advice that you've received, um, more broadly speaking, at any stage that, that sort of meant that you had a change in mentality and philosophy and principle? I kind of like, um, it's funny because like we can read lots of things now to help us to sort of open up channels to be successful. And, Somebody, somebody, I don't know if I read it or someone said it to me, the biggest mistake you can make is to be afraid to make one. And I was kind of like, if you think about it in a football match or anything you do, you do nothing if you were worried about making a mistake. And it's the same with a microphone. If, if the microphone becomes the new ball, you get on the ball, you make something happen and don't be afraid to do that. It's the same with, with a microphone. And I think that is, 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 is something to hang on to through life. But, I, but also, I think whatever you do, you have to love it. And that creates a different feeling for me. If I'm not enjoying it, or I don't love it, then I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to give up. And I never give up. So I think, you know, it's, and when, I, when I was, uh, we worked with psychologists, we had, Arsene Wenger had one who worked with him. And um, he was asking me to, 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 to describe the most difficult moment on a football pitch. A tricky ball that goes over your head, and it's difficult to deal with. And if you fear that ball, then your body is rigid and it, it bounces off you and uh, into the path of a striker who puts it in the back of the net. But if you love it and you embrace it and it's your moment, you just pluck it out of the sky and then there's this silence and there's a trill of applause from the crowd and you punch it back to the keeper as if you're a million dollars. And it, it very much is a different emotion. And that was probably the best piece of advice anyone ever gave me in how to put it into practice on a, in, on a football field. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Martin. Um, next, let's move on to the audience questions. Just put your hand up um, and I will call upon you. Any questions from anyone? Um, we will start with um, the guy on the end just there. There's a microphone coming. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, obviously, this morning, your colleagues, um, Gary, Gary Neville, Gary Lineker, um, they've, they've released this sort of open letter and a, and a petition for regulation, but... I can't believe they didn't ask me to sign it. They, they don't obviously have my <laughs> number. Or I'm not going to impact enough. But um, no, I think we, it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, but meanwhile, your employers um, are possibly, arguably, culpable for, you know, creating the gulf in the English football pyramid and also disregarding um, match going fans with regards to sort of the match times, um, you know, with away fans having to like travel back, um, you know, from Newcastle to London, wherever it is. Yeah. Um, what is that? What's the role of the this sort of pundit in that kind of side of the game when they're both asking for um, an independent regulatory body and also working for a company that um, ultimately, you know, pick out is out not, you not helping fans? Yeah, but okay, so the moving of the games now has changed, yeah? 
So they've changed the game. So what, what, what Jurgen Klopp was particularly unhappy with, wasn't he, was the 12.30 fixtures after playing a European Wednesday night fixture. So that's now going to change to 7.45 for the Saturdays. Now that impacts on the fans, but it's better for the, it, it's the less of two evils really. And this is where it comes back to, you know, travel and how we look after our supporters in another way. You can't blame the Premier League for everything. And they bought these packages because they thought they were good value to pay that. Now what then the clubs do with that money isn't really the fault of the broadcaster. So, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think, you're saying that the broadcaster has put all this money and has created this evil or this, this problem, but you know, what the money, what happens to money, should be, we're talking about regulation. If it's regulated, then we can distribute the money better. That has to be what we look for next. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, so 7.45, don't blame the broadcaster. That's what's been agreed by the Premier League. <laughs> but if you're a fan and you're a, you're a Newcastle fan and it's down in London, as it will be invariably, how are you getting home? Well, that's the government. That's a question for the government about transportation, about getting these poor fans home again after, the, you know, so let's keep it local maybe. Uh, for these 745 fixtures, but it's, it's quite difficult to navigate. When you put it in the computer, it all comes out, doesn't it, in a certain way. They should be able to work it through. You know, the European fixtures start, don't they, at a certain time of the season. Who might be left in the competition? And now they play in Newcastle that weekend, Chelsea. Well, let's not make them travel, you know, 745 down to London on a Saturday night. Awesome. Who's next? Um... We will go to the front just here and then the lady just there after. Thank you very much for coming. Um, you talked about how early in your career your move away from Arsenal was kind of motivated by your emotions and you let them maybe get the better of you a bit. These days players, young players, are doing the opposite and like selling themselves to an agent to kind of run their career for, the, for them. How do you think the balance is between an agent's influence on a player's career and, and their own kind of you know, decisions on that? So you're talking about agents in football. Um, it's interesting, I never, uh, say never, I never really used an agent. I used the PFA on two or three occasions. Um, and then sort of at the back end, I was comfortable about uh, what I needed. I mean, De Bruyne now has just signed a brand new contract at Man City. He was very much wanting to stay. He knows what the market value is. He knows what other players are earning. So. It's, it's a funny thing with agents. It's kind of like, because your career's in your own hands. Um, a clever agent, though, can open doors for players. You get moves for players that they, they might ordinarily not get. So it's a balancing act. Um, but if you, it's about getting to the right club first, um, as early as you possibly can. Um, and, and choose very carefully, really. I mean, I would say, I wouldn't, my son has gone through the professional football route. He's now injured, he's got issues, he's got to try and get fit and get back in. But I ordinarily wouldn't have anybody representing him that I, I, I didn't really trust or felt was worthy of, of being better than him. So it, we brought somebody in who was very experienced, could help him, was a good friend, somebody with the right moral compass, somebody that you think is, is in education almost in himself. There are agents like that around. A lot of them are just uh, interested in the money. You see the vast amounts of money now that, that are going out of the game. Imagine if that money wasn't going to the agents and was going to lower down. So I do think they get too much. Um, but if, I'm, if I was talking to a young player now, I'd say, okay, right, you need, yes, think about an agent, but concentrate on yourself first. Because uh, if you're talented enough, the clubs will come calling. The agent doesn't get you the clubs, your talent does. Uh, it just then needs managing and then you need people to work through the contracts and make sure that you're protected going forward. That would be, you know, if you're an, if you're an outstanding talent now, you probably would need someone just to protect you. But you could go to a lawyer. You have specialist lawyers around now and they all come. You want a good team around you. It's not just about an agent. You know, it's, it's about a nutritionist. It's, you know, psychologist. You, you need tr trainers, fitness trainers. Everything now is so professional. You, you, you eat now, not, not for pleasure, you eat to, to be like a Formula One car, you know, you know, and these bits can't be changed like a car, so you've got to take great care of everything. Um, and the last thing you want is an agent coming along uh, and he's only got one, it's fixated with money and 
um, you know, make you know what pathway you're on. So it's it's it's, an, it's not an easy decision, but um, you have to what you know you have to really tread carefully. And I felt okay. Um, I mean, I went to Aston Villa. My brother William's here today, and I, my dad did my deal when I went. To, now that's not right either, because they just sat there saying yes, 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 and it was like okay, what do we do now? Let's sign, give us. Let's we sign, do we? Well, no, actually, we we should have stepped back. And, um, but nonetheless, you know, so don't be naive. You've got to have professionals around you, but the right professionals. Awesome. Um, and we'll just go to the lady just there. Um, and then after this gentleman in the front. Um, it's probably an understatement to say that Arsenal had a bit of a disappointing season, but I was wondering, as Arsenal fans, do you think that under Kroenke, Arsenal can return to being a big club, or do we need to accept that that's just not going to happen as long as he's the owner? I don't think it's ever going to happen on, on the, the Kronkes, no. I don't think we're ever going to be back where we were. Um, I, I do think it's about a financial model. Um, I do feel that the money that he's spent so far, I mean, I'm happy for him to prove me wrong, um, but at the moment it's been about buying shares. So that suggests this is a very smart businessman who's bought very, lots of franchises in other sports, in, uh, in America particularly, basketball, you name it, he's bought it. Um, is he going to sell? Uh, I'm told that he's a very private man and that he's, um, very, he doesn't give very much away. No one really quite certain what, what he might do next. I'm not even sure that his, his son would know that. Um, I think it's good for the ego to, to own a big football club in England, the stadia, um, what it represents. So I don't think he's going to give it up lightly. I think maybe money will talk for him. If that's what he's about, and he's a businessman, we're going to see, aren't we? Because he either puts money in and Arsenal are successful and can get back to where they were, or he gives it up and he gives it to somebody else and lets our great club carry on being successful. So. We're at a crossroads in, in, our, in our career, in our, in our history arsenal at the moment. Um, and Gronke has a big, big, big decision to make. So I want him to, he's promising to spend money, spend it. If you can't spend it, move on. Awesome. Um, we'll go to um, last two questions, person in the front here and the person just there. Thank you very much for talk so far. So one thing I found really, really interesting was your discussion of Arsene Wenger and his managerial style um, and the sort of lessons you learnt from that and perhaps other great leaders, captains you played alongside. I was wondering if you have sort of any lessons of leadership, both sort of football specific and kind of life in general. Well, it's, it's impossible to be in, in the same room as Arsene Wenger and not, and not learn something from him. You know, he was a man of felt the routine was, was really important. And now we've all just come through this pandemic and we've lost some of our routines and now we're about to, today's the first day we're allowed to be in a room together, isn't it? We're actually, this is actually, we're creating history here today, aren't we? This is the first live Zoom, is that? You're exactly, it's the first ever event that we've been able to live stream via Zoom to those who have signed up um, as well. We're breaking records. We're breaking records, yeah. Roger Bannister, four minute mile, <laughs> exactly. just down the road here today. Um, so yeah, it was impossible to, you, you, ha, you were learning something every day. I mean, he would talk about keeping things simple in your life and then you take that into your football. So some of the footballers would have, you know, five or six watches, no, just one watch, keep it in one car, you know, one girlfriend, Adam. <laughs> I just, don't, I'll take com <laughs> don't complicate your life and just take that into your football. And then you found yourself in your football doing exactly the same, making the right choices, the simple choices, not complicating your football. And the two do work together. Uh, he was incredibly stable, solid and consistent with his management. And then I think that spreads through the team. It's like a family, really, as you all grow older and have kids. And if mum and dad are arguing, you know, it filters to the, to the children. They're fighting with one another. It, it's how it works. And that's how a, a well-run football club runs, really. Um, you treat each other with respect. That was a... Um, evident with, uh, with Arsene Wenger and it was you weren't sure who was creating who was thinking of the idea was it the manager was it you but there was something special at work um, because everything you were doing was being valued 
Uh, and it was actually, it, I felt it was spooky in some of the games. It was like you could actually, you start to, it was like Back to the Future. You know, have you seen that film? It's like working out, I, know, I can change the course of history here. Whatever name's going on that trophy, I can do it. What's going to happen in this game? You know, what's the most important games ahead of me? Thinking out of the box. And I think he created that. He made everything possible. You know, it was a, we, we, we had a massive belief. It was almost uh, religious-like into games. So um, I never got the chance to put that into practice and going into management that for various reasons. Uh, but I learned a hell of a lot from being with him. Um, and he's a special individual. Um, and I, I still miss those chats. And as soon as you're together, you're trying to, you're working on things straight away about a, an idea or a, the, the current team or life itself or working through, because now he's stepped back, hasn't he? And his motto used to be a lot of the time, people, people don't look at what people can do. They always look at what they can't do, whether it be, you, I'm referring to girlfriends again, boyfriends, whatever it is. We look at what they can't do, look at what they can do. And he was fantastic at being able to do that. And that's a great, that's a great quality, because a lot of managers I've worked with, they don't, they look at, they're blinded by what you can't do. And you feel that, that energy, that negative energy, but with him, it was always positive. Um, and that was probably the biggest lesson I learned. Yeah. And him. the last question um, of the event is the gentleman in the blue mask. Cheers. Um, so this is quite, probably quite a big one to end on, but do you have like any major or big regrets over the course of your career? So I'm thinking of like your reaction maybe to when Van Nistelrooy missed the penalty or an incident with Kevin Sheedy. Well, regrets. Well, it, I kind of feel that if it was right then, it's right now. Because we can always look back and say, oh, I should have done that, should have done that. But if you analyse enough in the moment, mm -hmm. you can't really have any regrets. Although, you know, I, I, um, somebody, I, meant, I bumped into a Villa fan just a few days ago and uh, he said to me about uh, Paul McGrath and that would have been one hell of a partnership if I got a chance to play with Paul McGrath. As I left, he came in. And Graham Taylor, Taylor God rest his soul, wouldn't refuse to tell me. He wouldn't tell me. He said he was signing this outstanding central defender. I thought it was a wind-up uh, international player to come to Aston Villa. So that's a little bit of a regret that I didn't get a chance to play with him. Might have changed my mind going to Everton. I probably wouldn't have done. I was almost committed to go. So that, that might have been a regret. Shouldn't have left Arsenal, perhaps. I might be sitting here now with more trophies than any other player's ever won. But actually, uh, I might have been there just for five minutes. Me and George Graham were arguing all the time. It wouldn't have survived. Surely I wouldn't have survived it. The, uh, it was too clashy. So, no, I don't, think, um, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's healthy to have regrets. I should have scored the cup final, got a winning goal in the UEFA Cup final. Uh, although I cleared one off the line a few seconds later uh, and it went to penalties and we lost. Um, but you have to take the good and the bad, the rough and the smooth, and by and large, I have to look back. And I hope that, we talked a lot about Wenger, I hope he can do that. And I hope any player that finishes can do that, can let go and say, okay, yes, it could have been better, but I'll, have to, I'll accept what we did together. Awesome. Um, thank you so, so much, everyone, for joining us um, this evening. And thank you, Martin, for your time. It was very insightful. Um, I'll be definitely taking a lot of tips from it, from girlfriends to socks and spreading <laughs> passions along. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much.